Chapter 1. Last Dive's Secrets The Flesh Tailor? Emily asked, narrowing her eyes at Mistress Arata suspiciously. He's not some kind of, like, horrible Cenobite, right? Mistress Arata scoffed and gave Emily's knee a weak slap. No, darling. Cenobites have far more pageantry and flair. Then what is he? Emily asked, looking over to Yopuya, who was still lounging in the lap of the Mothwoman warrior. One of the shadow creatures or some kind of lost god? Mistress Arata looked down unsurely at Emily, as if mulling over in her head just how much to let slip of her knowledge on the situation. Emily noticed that her many chitinous legs were twitching and clicking as she thought, and it made her skin crawl again. They believe they are gods, Mistress Arata said after a long pause, gesturing with her hand towards the now-returned scorpion woman. Though they never were, nor are they supposed to be. The scorpion woman clicked her way across the floor, her back bearing a large tray held in place by her silver-tipped stinger. Emily watched her and saw that her body behaved in similar ways to Mistress Arata. Her humanoid torso stopped just under her buttocks, and from there seemed to inweave and socket itself into the armored plating of the scorpion below her. Her body was lithe, tan, and decorated with many swirling blood-red tattoos. Much like Mistress Arata and the rest of her women compatriots, she was beautiful, which clashed highly with the rest of the rather buggy parts of their body. She smiled prettily at Davin, Tarj, Marill, and Yopuya, setting down the teapot and smaller tray she held in her hands before turning and grabbing the larger tray of food she held in place on her armor plates. So what is he? Emily said dourly, watching Tarj eyeball the scorpion woman while picking up a small tea cake. Mr. Serrata shrugged. He carries the same magical signature as your benefactor. By that, I mean, it confuses the rest of us just as deeply. They are not of the world, if not, dare I say, our plane of existence. Corrupted, out of place, and possibly beyond their time. I'm afraid I cannot say more purely because I do not know more about them. They are blocked from my sight, and the sight of others. That's because they're one of the oldest races, a race of creation for creation. The torque said into Emily's mind, but it faded away almost as quickly as it came, and Emily didn't bother engaging with it. But they helped create the things that are eating people, like the big slug thing that almost got me in Walla Walla, Emily growled, remembering back to the terrifying run through the airport. Mistress Arata nodded tapping at her plush bottom lip almost seductively. We believe they are somehow bleeding their essence in an attempt to... procreate? I believe that is the right word. Gross! Emily murmured, then sat up straight and back as the scorpion woman deftly clambered over furniture to bring another fresh tray of drinks and treats for both her and Mistress Arata. Thank you, Armila. Mistress Arata said with a smile, already bending down on her centipede plates to expertly pour both herself and Emily tea. Ormilla bowed reverently. My pleasure, mistress. Would Miss Bronze care for some macaroni fillo? Before Emily could reply, Mistress Arata sniffed a soft laugh. Ormilla, Emily still has things to do today. I don't think she needs the comfort of your venom. Emily flicked her eyes from Ormilla to Mistress Arata, who was dolloping into her cup the exact amount of sugar and cream she lacked in her tea. But Emily didn't want to know how Mistress Arata knew that, or how she got the information in the first place. Now that she thought of it, she was going to have to square off against someone called the Flesh Tailor. Her enemies and benefactor were some kind of creation race, and on top of all this, multiple powerful factions were watching her with interest such as Mistress Arata. Emily made sure Davin, Maril, Tarj, and Yapuya were distracted in making their own tea, then held up her hand to Ormilla, holding her thumb and forefinger together with a smidge of space in between. Ormilla smiled prettily again, and her tail loomed forward, the silver cap of her stinger glinting in the soft light. Not too much, Ormilla, Mistress Arata said with an amused smile, holding the steaming cup of tea towards the scorpion girl. Of course, mistress. 
Ormilla answered back with a grin, and Emily saw she had very pretty, pointed fangs. Ormilla's stinger dipped down towards Emily's teacup, and the very tip rested against the lip of the cup, dispensing a sharp dosage of red liquid. Mistress Arata quickly stirred Emily's cup, then handed it back to Ormilla, who took it with a nod of her tattooed head, her short chestnut hair catching the light. Ormilla turned her body, her tail in and back to its resting place, and she offered the cup to Emily with soft, delicate hands that still bore old white scar lines of a time before. Here, Miss Bronze, it will be best to drink slowly and steadily, as gulping it down may cause the venom to hit very quickly, which may prove detrimental to your walking ability. Emily took the cup, then slammed it back at once, opening her throat to quickly chug the entire vessel. Both Mistress Arata and Ormilla stared at Emily wide-eyed as she set the cup down on the table in front of them, exhaling fragrant breath past her lips as she pushed her palms down the thighs of her pants. Emily cleared her throat as the venom-laced tea burned down to her stomach like a shot of alcohol, then turned to Mistress Arata. So, this tailor guy, he has the crown I'm after? Yes, we believe so. A powerful device that holds two other pieces. Many of us theorize that this will help push these gods back into their own plane of existence and possibly even keep the water from rising. We can't divine too much, but from what we can tell, the being that has chosen you is on our side. Ormella smiled again. Which is even more odd, as humans do not even exist. Ormila. Mr. Serrata said sharply, glaring down at the scorpion woman with an air of warning to her eyes. Her Russian accent gained an edge to it that Emily didn't like. Ormilla bowed her head almost immediately, looking down at the tabletop as her tail sagged in the admonishment. Emily could feel the drug-like effects of the venom now coursing through her chest and limbs, the buzzing numbness pleasant as she raised an eyebrow. Not the first time something has told me that. Ormilla is a minor seer and she should know better than to drop such subjects without leeway. Mistress Arata said again, her tone low and rife with caution. But her eyes came away from Ormilla to Emily. But she is correct. Humans are an anomaly that none of us knew of until the events that brought our planes together. Pleasure is deeper in you. Ormilla started, looking up to Mistress Arata to see if she could go further. When she nodded, Ormilla continued. Her tail swam slightly. Fear, more shattering. Love, more burning. We have never captured dreams and nightmares as vivid as those of humans. It is as if your soul went brighter than the rest of ours. Mistress Aratan nodded. And these trifling creator beings seem to hunger for humans far more than any of us. As if you are sustaining to them. Like a tree, baked and prepared to the taste of a single entity. Ormilla said, nodding sagely. Grand, Emily said sourly, rubbing at her eyelids with her thumbs. Do you know where he is? This flesh tailor person, whatever it is. We do not, Mr. Serrata said sadly as she drank from her own cup of tea. But there are those who do. There is a bar down towards the mouth of the cavern systems, where divers like to congregate. Called the Last Dive. It is run by a dragoness by the name of Quietly, and a diver has come back with information regarding the lower depths. Emily sighed, running a hand through her hair. Information does not come free. What are you wanting from me? I'm wanting your favor. Emily Bronze, Mr. Serrata said, finishing her cup of tea and setting it down on a raised chitinous leg. Should you succeed, I want you to remember us fondly, to let everyone know it was I, Mistress Arata, who gave you the things you needed to know. Emily flattened her lips up at Mistress Arata, lowering her eyelids halfway. You want street cred? Not in such a regard, Mr. Serrata began, but Ormilla giggled. And Mistress Arata rolled her eyes. Okay, well, it's not really street cred, as you say, but more instrumental influence. 
Emily smirked, her head becoming delightfully fuzzed by Armilla's venom. Yeah, sure, I can put in a good word. Though, we must be going, the time's coming up. Mr. Serrata and Ormilla nodded, as if understanding just what Emily was on about, and they both rose up higher on their legs as Emily stood and wobbled. I wish we could offer more, but there is not much that we can, Mr. Serrata said, trailing beside Emily as they both walked towards the rest of her party. Where you are going, we cannot help, and what we could normally see, we cannot. Emily waved a hand affably. Ah, uh, it's no big deal. Clearly you've done enough for my friends here. Emily looked down at Yapuya, whose head was neatly snuggled in between Mika's rainbow sherbet-colored breasts and devouring her sixth turkey sandwich. Davin was eating a small finger cake while chatting up a more gothic-looking moth woman, the two conversing about how accurate or inaccurate armors were in fantasy games. Then she looked towards Tarj and Morel, who were both equally enjoying the large spread before them, with only Morel having the grace to look sheepish. Morel cleared her throat, wiping mustard away from her bottom lip. Uh, sorry, Emily. Caloric intake needs and all that. We said I don't shy away from free food. Especially freshly carved chicken and Havarti sandwiches, Tar said happily as he chewed away. And Emily saw that in his other hand it was a can of cola someone had fetched for him. We ought to come back here on the way out if we survive. Mistress Arata chuckled, folding her arms under her large chest. We do not mind at all. <laughs> awesome. Tarj said earnestly, quickly picking up a few more sandwiches and tossing them into his chest pockets for the road. Emily looked up at Mistress Arata with a side eye. If we come back, that is. I have faith that you will, Mistress Arata said firmly. But even Emily could see the fear on the edge of her eyes. You sure we couldn't stay longer? Tarj asked as they all walked down the lantern-lit path outside Mistress Arata's place of business, heading out back to the streets. We could use the calories, and a power nap wouldn't hurt. Can't, Emily said shortly, wobbling a little in her knees as Ormilla's venom began to truly mature in her system. We're on a time schedule, and this woman down in a bar has the information we need. Muriel could sense something was off about Emily purely by the smell of her sweat but didn't know what it was and just shrugged her shoulders. How much time we got, you think? A day and a wake up. After that, the crown may have moved by then, Emily said with a sigh, her boots thudding on the concrete sidewalk. Yapuya grumped from atop Davin's shoulders, but he didn't pay her any mind as he turned to Emily. Pretty tight timetable for crawling through the tunnels of the earth. This bar woman going to have some kind of shortcut for us? I hope so, Emily said, her lips quirked down in a curt frown. After we're done here, I hope we get a nice long break before the next Earth Shattering mission comes down from on high. Here's to hoping, Tar said cheerfully as he pulled a spare sandwich from his breast pocket. They all made their way down the dark, lamp-lit sidewalk, keeping to one side while everyone else kept well clear of them. Word seemed to travel fast down in the twists of Vegas, and people were giving Emily a wide berth. Emily didn't really care, nor mind, as she was more focused on finding this diver bar Mistress Arata had told her of. They made it a mile down the neon-lit street before a sudden commotion brought them all to a halt, traffic on the road slowing as well as on the sidewalk. The fuck is that noise? Marill said, her ears perked and hand drifting down towards the snub-nosed M2 that hung near her side. Davin tilted his head. Sounds like a bonfire. Yeah... A big bonfire, Tar said absentmindedly, wiggling a finger in his ear. If it's a bonfire, why is it moving? Emily said, pointing to a faint glow amongst the darkness and neon-lit fog. A man dressed in a well-tailored suit came tumbling down from a tavern-themed casino a hundred yards down the street, hair singed in suit-trailing smoke. Combustion Fox! Combustion Fox! What are we supposed to do about that? Marilla asked, turning to look at Emily, but startling heavily as the entire casino's front end seemed to explode outwards like a pop bubble. Fucking hell! Tar screamed, shrinking backwards as waves of heat, debris, and body parts rained down onto them and everyone else on the sidewalk and street. Emily leaned to the side as a flaming arm came cartwheeling down at her and her party, the limb landing with a hissing splat on the sidewalk. Emily looked down at it, blinking blankly. Wow! That's right. There it is, a woman screamed, and everyone on the sidewalk took off at a sprint across the street. Vehicles turned and burned rubber in their haste to escape as well, 
and some of the foot traffic were quickly turned into roadkill as they bounced off the bumpers of electric vans and tunnel lorries. Emily squinted, and sure enough, a bright ember-like thing was casually hopping down the sizzling steps of the once-was casino, its white-hot paws hopping along in a happy gait. The combustion fox looked quite pleased with itself as it held four hamburgers in its mouth, its fur licking with flame that was so hot that the tips glowed blue and green, blending down into the white, yellow, and red flames that warbled the air. Ah, it's cute, Yapuya said from atop Davin's shoulders, but Davin held her fast against him. Let it walk by. It was hungry, Davin said cautiously, eyeing the creature warily. Emily turned her head an inch towards Davin as she too watched the combustion fox. Ormilla's venom still in her system, but fading as adrenaline kicked up the octane in her blood. It just blew up like 20 people for hamburgers. Most people give them what they touch with their paw, Davin said, watching as traffic slammed to a halt on the street as the combustion fox began to cross. Someone must have thought it was a dog and slapped it or something. Yapuya tilted her head, making grabby wing claws at it. But it's so cute. How does it... How... Could it? Tarz began, having thrown the rest of his sandwich across the sidewalk as he startled. Davin raised a brow and looked at Tarz, a wry smile on his face. Magic, of course. Fang meddling with each species, Muriel continued, lowering her snub-nosed M2. They thought it would be cool to make a literal fire fox, but failed to contain the creation. It began mating with other foxes, and the magic carried over. Emily towed the still-sizzling, blackened arm on the sidewalk, then rubbed the toe of her boot on the concrete. Well, that was something. Shall we continue on? Everyone nodded, briskly walking down the sidewalk and stepping over body parts as the sirens of medical vehicles began to wail in the distance. When the same combustion fox was spotted only a couple of yards to their left, having apparently gotten a sudden taste for pan-fried noodles, Emily and everyone else started running down the sidewalk. The arrival of control golems from the security enforcement group, as well as combat mages, urged everyone into a sprint as another fiery detonation curled into the heavy, neon-lit fog of the Vegas Twists. A lorry carrying a load of popcorn was hit by the flaming oil from the noodle shop, and now careened down the street, trailing smears of flame and freshly popping corn. Yapuya had a mind to go get some of this popcorn from the street, only barely restrained by both Davin and Tarj as Emily led them all onward puffing with the exertion. To say they made good time was an understatement, and were all huffing and puffing with other foot traffic further down in the terraces. Emily held her hand at a stitch in her side, leaning up and breathing heavily as she looked around. Anyone see the bar? Those little bastards are fucking evil. Tarz panted, fighting to keep down all the sandwiches that were still in his stomach. Muriel sniffed, not winded at all. Not exactly sane, either, knowing how to fare. Probably think they're all entitled to all the food they wish due to their explosive nature. Emily grimaced, leaning backwards while still holding her sides. Yeah, well, I guess that's life as a living bomb. Bye's down there, Emily, Muriel said, pointing down at a rather convincing-looking medieval tavern, complete with a stone foundation, wide upper levels, and a claw machine on its front porch seating area. The buildings around it didn't seem to fit any kind of style or theme either, and were just cluttered around each other in sprawling chaos. Biker bars shrugged up next to honky-tonks, their patrons glaring at each other ruefully. Inner planer sports bars where one could watch basketball on one television while another played competitive jump roping, where only beings with more than two legs could participate, sat cat corner to a Victorian-themed wine bar complete with fainting couches. A steel road diner, sporting a robust-looking jukebox and waitresses on rollerblades, shared a spot with a Mongolian yurt, where only the finest fermented mare's milk was served. What in the French toast fuck are we looking at? Emily guffawed with a grin, the venom still keeping her mood a bit elevated. Maril crossed her arms under her ample chest, grinning along with Emily. From the looks of it, the best selection of buys I have ever seen. Look! There's even a tapanyaki in Saki Izakaya. Don't we want the diver bar, though? The one that looks like an inn? Tarj asked, pointing down to the rustic-looking building. Emily nodded. Yeah, that's the one. We have to find some woman named Quiet. Let's be sure to make a good first impression, then. Davin said and patted Yopuya on the knee before setting off down the street. Everyone else following behind him. 
Emily looked around her as they walked and saw that almost everyone here was some form of the unusual tradesman, and there were no signs whatsoever of what could be called nobility. This was a workman's area, much like what they had already passed through, but a different vibe sat all around here. These were the kinds of people living fast with a lot of money, spending it freely to have a good time or savor the good things in life. Diver country. Emily had never seen so many divers around in one place, all of them lugging rucksacks and gear or weapons. Hell, some even wore their trophies and fines on their belts as they strode down the streets. The first batch of bars they passed, no one seemed to pay them any mind. But as they got closer towards the last dive, the more word got around through text message and phone call. Now people were paying attention, turning in their seat with drink in hand to observe the famous Emily Bronze. Emily was now more grateful than ever that she had Ormilla's venom coursing through her veins, even as faded as it was now. Eyes from all over were peering or leering at her, some in awe, some in degradation, others in more predatory ways that made her skin crawl. It was a relief when they reached the front porch of the last dive, and Emily could hear the laughter and clinking of glasses past the heavily curtained windows. It appeared those inside relished their privacy. Something Emily felt was peculiar. Davin pulled Yapuya from his shoulders, who immediately ran over to harass the claw machine, then pulled open the door. The immediate blast of noise, talking, music, and overall fanfare hit Emily in the face like a punch, and she had to master herself in order not to stagger backwards. Davin ambled in, as did Marill and Tarj, and Emily looked over to Yapuya. Come on, bird girl, no diver left behind, Emily said. Yapuya slammed her wing claw into the glass with a snarl. Stupid machine steal money. Price is shit anyhow. That's the spirit, Emily murmured in response as Yapuya whirled in after Tarj and she shut the door behind her. The last dive was every bit an adventurer's tavern as it could be, fully embracing the spirit of old world charm and the vibrant clash of modernity. The tables and long bar were made of wood, rough hewn and looked as if they were pulled off the cover of an RPG magazine. The stools were the same, constructed of steel and raw wood, and Emily reckoned they were sturdy since they held up a rather portly-looking diver with ease. Above the dozens of tables were low-hanging chandeliers, their faces adorned with anything from skulls to knickknacks. Emily even spied a Furby speared jauntily on one that had a metal spike, its eyes out of canter and rolled skywards. Candles were strewn about them, dripping low with wax and guttering black smoke up towards the ceiling. Right back at home, Marill said with a smile, knocking off her hoof boots on the wooden floorboards. Tars grimaced. Yeah, maybe a little too close to home. The neon jukebox is a nice touch, though. Yep, a small kitchen, Yapuya said, quickly scrambling over to a table and sitting at it happily, drumming her wing claws across it and looking around for a waiter. Emily craned her head around, trying to see past those standing at the bar and milling about the tables. Need to find the person who runs this place. There's a lot of humans in here, now that I'm looking closely enough. You'll only find humans in here, mostly. A man said from a nearby smaller table. His legs crossed over each other as he scrolled through a phone he yelled on his knee. Pardon? Emily replied, turning to look at him. He was a rough sort, obviously a diver, and had a few days of stubble adorning his narrow chin. His uniform was ragged and judging from the mud on his boots, Emily reckoned he must have just come up from the depths. The man looked up at Emily, pulling a long pipe from his lips. This is a human diver bar. Only Tanyo you'll find in here are those attached to diver groups, like yours. Do you know who runs this place? Emily asked, looking over her shoulder to see the rest of her group sit down with Yopuya, who was already harassing a dwarves waiter. The human nodded and gestured with the stem of his pipe. That one over there, tailed one in the britches. Emily trailed her gaze to where the man pointed, and tilted her head to the side as she watched a long, feathered tail arc into the sky and sway above the heads of a few divers at the bar. Huh. Well, thank you, Emily murmured, resetting her shoulder holster with a roll of her shoulders. The man shrugged. Don't mention it. Be careful, though, she bites. Hee-haw, Emily droned, rolling her eyes as she started moving through the crowd of divers. This proved more difficult than she had first thought, having to backtrack around tables as drinkers and diners pushed their chairs out, or leaned back in laughter to block her way in such frequency it almost seemed deliberate. For the first time since she had begun this journey, 
Emily wished that her status was known here because at least people would get the fuck out of her way and she could get this over with. When she finally found her way to the bar, she shouldered in between two larger Missourians, their shoulders bearing the diver patch of the Ozark Orwellians. They grumbled some matter, but made space for Emily when she blew a strand of hair away from her face and openly snarled at him. Emily could now see the length of the bar and noticed the dwarves that was serving her friends was openly arguing with a rather odd-looking woman. The dwarves gestured behind her, wiggling her pen pad at Yopuya, who was already chewing through a bread basket at speed. I can't be serving them quietly. They're part of a group. They are divas, and we have all divas here. Quietly said in a hushed Germanic accent, smiling brightly with her fangs glinting in the candlelight. Now, go get them drinks. From what I hear, they're going to need them. Emily leaned forward over the bar to get a better look at the woman, and could see that same odd feathered reptilian tail lashing in annoyance near the ground. The woman didn't look much like a dragon, except for the tail, the odd feathered ears, and the reptilian pupils. If anything, she just looked like a shorter-than-average woman with a lithe, athletic figure, though Emily did find the amount of stools along the floor of the bar cute, since Quietly's chest was the same height as the bar itself. Quietly grabbed a mug, filled it to the brim with some kind of sparkling gooseberry mead, then made her way over towards Emily. Emily sat back on her stool as Quietly kicked over a stool, which were apparently on lock and runners, and stepped up on it to look at Emily eye to eye. Um, I... I, I didn't order anything, Emily stammered, leaning further back away from the bar as Quietly grinned at her, her long canines flashing. I know, Quietly said politely, setting down the mug in front of Emily. Gregory, Danye, go sit somewhere else. Yes, ma'am, they both said, and quickly scooped up their own drinks to move further down the bar, casting glares in Emily's direction. Fucking priss, Gregory growled, bringing his mug to his lips. Daniel nodded clicking his teeth. Bitch thinks she's special or something because she's the chosen one. Ah, Emily said, knocking her knuckles on the bar top. So everyone here does know. Quietly smiled. Of course they do. You're a big name down here in the diver bars. Made quite the splash if you arrive at the airport. Not by choice, Emily grumbled, grasping the handle of the mug and bringing it towards her. Mistress Arata sent you to come find me. Yes, she's not the only seer in this place, you know, quietly said patiently. And so you come to the last dive. Emily blinked, sipping at her mug while looking around her. Um, yes? Quietly leaned across the bar, her long tail flicking back and forth behind her like a cat's. You come for the old one that is dwelling below, one who calls himself the Flesh Tailor. He who bears a piece of the crown. Yes? Emily murmured again, wincing as Yapuya's voice raised above the crowd. You want some of Yoipua? Bring here, big bitch! Yapuya screamed, and Emily could hear Tars trying to wrangle her. Yoipua, calm down. He didn't mean anything by it. Quietly didn't seem to notice, or may not have been caring, too, as she continued staring into Emily's eyes. He alone has kids seven diver groups. No one ever comes back from the deaths nowadays. Oh? Emily said, suddenly finding her mouth very dry despite the sweet mead. Quietly nodded, idly tapping a finger against the bar tap. Sews them up into the wards of his lair, the ones he likes. Anyway, they're not dead, not alive, just there, soon together in limbo with the frets of life. So I'll, uh, bring scissors then, I suppose. Emily clipped, quickly taking another gulp of the mead as quietly guffawed, her nose wrinkling and even snorting a few times. Quietly chuckled a bit, then thumped her fist against the bar top a few times. <laughs> you are brave, despite the fear wafting off of you. I can smell it. On your skin, you know. You could just walk away. Emily looked hard at Quietly, the dragon woman's face still smiling at her in a teasing manner. Eyes glinting, but she sighed, setting down the mug. I know I can. I know I could, but I know I shouldn't for fear of what may happen if you do, quietly said, and Emily nodded. It's all bullshit, this being the chosen one thing. I never even wanted this. I was just trying to drop off a dead co-worker's things. Emily sighed out, resting her cheek on her hand. I just wanted to make some money, get out of my dead-end job, that's all. 
quietly nodded, then leaned down on her elbows, resting her chin on her hands. Yeah, being a hero sucks, huh? Yeah, it does, Emily said, looking over it quietly. Especially when you're just winging it. I used to scam dudes out of their money by playing up being a gun bunny. That doesn't really prepare someone for going down and duking it out with some wannabe god. Quietly laughed. <laughs> no one is ever prepared to be a hero, Emily Bronx. On my word, my job was to divine quests like these and fight those who would go forth and complete them. Do you know what it's like to send countless people to their deaths? Over and over again. Until one of them finally gets the job done. Emily swallowed, clearing her throat and then sitting up again. No, I don't. Obviously. I used to throw bean juice into cups and juggle guns on stream. It is a poor job. I prefer doing this. Serving drinks to the men and women who risk their lives, not sending them off to their dooms. Quietly said, leaning up and gesturing around the tavern as she slowly turned in a circle, her tail trailing behind her. Divers are such a treasure. They go willingly into horrible places to seek fortune, to prove their name for self-gain. It is true and honest. No flair or drama about it. Divers want money, glory. It is so undeniably human. Emily watched quietly sigh and look around her with a fondness that Emily could not understand. The dragon woman crossing her arms across her chest and grinning with every inch of her teeth. I got tired of elves, orcs, dwarves, and these other races. Humans burn so much brighter, so much louder. Every day they go on new adventures, merely because they can and want to. About the, you know, flesh tailor, I, Emily began, but was cut off as quietly turned to face her, her eyes burning with light. Then I hear that someone has been chosen for a quest to save us all. This rare place of united planes. I rolled my eyes. What would it be this time? An elf noble? Some powerful dwarven mage who can sunder the ground? Some fae looking to prove themselves better than the other fae? Quietly said brightly, and she crawled onto the top of the bar top with the help of her stool. Emily leaned back, and everyone else at the bar paused in their drink and a watch. Whoa, hey, I didn't mean... The fire light in Quietly's eyes blazed, so bright that even some light coursed down to her cheeks. I took a gander into the seer's void to search for the face of the so-called hero who would be marching to the doom once again. And what do I see? The whole tavern had rumbled down into a dull murmur, everyone watching quietly as she turned on her hands and sat down on the bar, her bare feet resting on Emily's thighs and tail lashing. I see some little human woman. Meek. Greedy, longing for gold, glory, and to no longer rest in the shadows of others. I saw what could possibly be the worst choice ever made for a hero to partake in the quest of such magnitude. Thanks, Emily said nervously, and the intense stare from quietly was starting to cause sweat to drip nervously down the small of her back. Emily was even starting to feel the heat on her cheeks from quietly's eyes. For the first time, in such a long time, I actually felt curiosity towards a hero. Quietly said, leaning in towards Emily's face until their noses were barely six inches apart. Her long, feathered tail curling in the air behind her. Why would an ancient being of power, such magnitude, choose such a little thing like you as her champion? When there are better choices, even in this here room, Emily glanced to her left and right as the glow from Quietly's eyes cascaded over her face, and she grimaced as she noticed the entire room was staring at her. I... uh... I don't... know. And isn't that the most curious thing of all? Quietly hissed, her grin so wide that Emily was afraid the small dragon woman was going to eat her. Others have gone before you, you know? Better, stronger, more capable humans with years under their belt. Going off to try and steal your glory, and all of them have failed. I wonder, I do ponder, that if you make it back with your price, what does that mean? What does that mean? Emily gulped as quietly touched the tip of her nose to her own, her eyes wide. What would that mean, you? 
Ah? Quietly hushed out, just barely audible for the both of them to hear. Then she leaned back, snapping her finger. Daniel. Yes, ma'am. Daniel said, already pulling out a small folder from the inside of his plate carrier. Daniel followed the last group to the cave entrance, but turned away at the last moment because he had a bad feeling about it. They were following a Kötokunach that said he could hear the being and knew its true location. Quietly said, still sitting on the bar as she took the folder from Daniel. These are the grid coordinations and elevation within the ground. Emily swallowed again, reaching up to take the folder as quietly offered it to her. Thank you, ma'am. This will make things easier, I believe. So will the side tunnel. Daniel said, pulling out a slip of paper from the folder and laying it on the cover. There was a cultist ambush a few days ago. They burrowed a tunnel straight across the main dugouts in order to take more prisoners. I reckon you could follow it right to the source. Quietly raised her foot and with her big toe jerked Emily's chin up. Time is racing, Emily Bronx. Get going and do what you need to do before any more of my treasures are killed. Right, Emily said jerking her head back and scrambling off the stool. Muriel, Davin, let's get out of here. I have a map. Yapuya looked up from her third bread basket, face layered with both disappointment and butter. But you ordered the burger. Off we go, Yoi. Tars said, quickly bundling up the harpy and following Emily's range walk out of the tavern. Everyone else following in suit. Muriel looked over her shoulder as Davin held the door open for her, and she looked to the human with a frown. I think I prefer the insect whorehouse to this place. Picky, picky, Davin said, ushering Muriel out and then closing the door solidly behind him.